thank you, sir, for your uh, kind uh, words. I'll go to my uh, presentation. Uh, uh, share screen. Uh, yeah. Share. So uh, today I'd like to share with this uh, August uh, group of uh, clinicians, and I'm sure there are uh, laboratorians also, my journey with a uh, viral uh, hemorrhagic fever virus, uh, which is now known as orthohantaviruses. Of course, at the time when I was doing my doctorate studies, it was just plain hantaviruses. Uh, so, um, is it clear? Am I audible? Yeah, you are audible so, and yeah. uh, it's full screen. Thank you. Please go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, I'd like to uh, today present my journey with the uh, diagnosis of orthohantaviruses in India. And um, as Dr. Chitkara has already introduced viral hemorrhagic fevers in India, they are a group of zoonotic diseases which are characterized by fever and bleeding disorders. They're all enveloped viruses, as we all know, and they have a single-stranded RNA genome. They uh, routinely use rodents, bats, uh, and insects for uh, transmission, and uh, those are their natural hosts. The uh, characteristic feature of all these viral hemorrhagic fevers are that they require a very low infectivity dose to cause disease. And uh, typically, if you look at the circulation of these viruses, they occur in areas where uh, areas which are habitats of their natural uh, hosts, uh, for example, the hard ticks or rodents, specific rodents which carry antiviruses or arena viruses. Uh, viral hemorrhagic fever uh, or human outbreaks of viral hemorrhagic fevers are very sporadic. They are irregular, as we have already seen uh, with the earlier talks. And uh, we see a lot of these viruses keep emerging and re-emerging as they get newer geographical areas and susceptible hosts in these newer geographical areas. Now, this slide is uh, just to present the more than one RNA segment. So this is the classification that we use uh, typically. And orthohantaviruses earlier belonged to uh, family Buniaviridae. Now it is has its own family of Hantaviridae. As you can see, the distribution of uh, hemorrhagic uh, fever uh, viruses uh, in uh, around the globe. I'd just like to point out the uh, Indian scenario where we have seen circulation of dengue virus all across the country, Kaisnur forest disease in Maharashtra, Karnataka, orthohantaviruses. Uh, we have researched it in Chennai and uh, Valore. And of course, uh, the others, uh, uh, the other uh, viruses that we have uh, seen, Dr. Chitkara mentioned the CCHF virus, mm -hmm. which we believe would have also migrated from Pakistan because Pakistan is known to have outbreaks of mm -hmm. CCHF virus. Now, before I go further into uh, the testing systems that we generally use, uh, there have been many questions which were, uh, which uh, or many people who have asked me uh, whether we could use, uh, what kind of testing can be used for uh, via, uh, VHFVs. Now, I would just like to put this slide because some of these viruses which can be transmitted from person to person, they belong to different risk groups and uh, everything cannot be tested in routine laboratories. For example, uh, Kaisenur forest disease, uh, we know they can be, there can be human to human transmission and they belong to risk group level three. Uh, and uh, WHO recommends that for Kaisenur forest disease, BSL level two, uh, should be used, but uh, we have a beautiful paper from uh, uh, from NIV, which uh, recommends using even uh, BSL level two, which is the level which is in uh, commonly seen in different laboratories. Also, hantaviruses do not get transmitted from person to person. So uh, even though it is a level three pathogen, BSL level two is enough. Uh, 
Uh, dengue, as we all know, or BSL level two is enough. But of course, if you're propagating the virus, you need to use level three laboratory. CCHF, routinely, it is a, a virus which belongs to level four, and it cannot be handled in uh, routine laboratories. It requires level three or level four laboratories. Of course, for specimen aliquoting to be sent to the reference laboratory, you could use a BSL level two facility. Uh, this is uh, this slide is presented just to uh, inform uh, others that many viruses cannot be handled in routine uh, laboratories. Audio is gone. Yeah. Internet issue, ma'am. She's, she's, she's disconnected. Yeah, yeah. I'll just call her and inform her. Sir. If it is taking time, we can we can take up some questions from the audience. Is she able to join? If it is taking time, we can take yeah. up some questions. Yes, sir. she is reconnecting. Uh, meanwhile, uh, if there are any questions, I request uh, our audience to post it on the chat box, and I request the RX event to kindly share it with us. Are there yeah. any questions in the chat box, please? Yeah. Dr. Chitkara, I would like to ask you, uh, is it possible to distinguish uh, vasculitis from a viral hemorrhagic fever clinically? In fact, uh, the basic teaching in pediatrics is that if you have a palpable purpura, it's likely to be vasculitis. If you have a non-palpable purpura, it is likely to be thrombocytopenic, and if you have a non-blanching purpura, it's always dangerous. In fact, if you look at the NHS guidelines, you will find the, uh, the non-blanching purpura as a red flag sign for fever. Your comments, please. Okay. Uh, good question, Bala. Uh, so first of all, what is vasculitis? Like you described, it is a palpable uh, lesion because ultimately it is information of various blood vessels, small to medium or others. Now to differentiate between a viral vasculitis, because most of the hemorrhagic viral fevers would in fact cause all these hemorrhagic rashes because of a vasculitis phenomenon only. So differentiate from a viral hemorrhagic uh, kind of a vasculitis from a collagen vascular or an autoimmune the first and foremost thing is the duration. Viral fevers are invariably short-lived by all those uh, chronic systemic inflammatory lesions or autoimmune diseases, you will have long drawn out symptom symptoms. That is why I said these vasculitis, which are of autoimmune or dysregulated immunity are invariably subacute or chronic type. Viruses on the other hand are acute within the first uh, two weeks and by by invariably by the end of first week one. Number two, all vasculitic rash, whether caused by viruses or a dysregulated immunity, may not blanch even if they are not purpuric. Yes, they are palpable because it is a local inflammatory reaction which occurs in the entire blood vessel. So one, vasculitis palpable, only the duration differs plus the underlying spectrum of a chronic inflammatory disease or an autoimmune disease. Like you'll have arthritis, skin rashes of different types, prolonged kind of an indolent pores, while viruses strike very fast, three, four days high fever and you go into all these symptoms. You'll have multi-organ failure, but invariably arthritis, eye involvement doesn't occur 
in most of these viral except uh, 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 these exanthems, except you may have sometimes a conjunctival congestion. If you compare like a Kawasaki, which is again a vasculitis, you will have bulbar conjunctivitis. But in most of the viral uh, rash, rashes with conjunctivitis, it is really a uniform bulbar as well as a palpebral conjunctivitis with or without discharge. So these are subtle differences of duration, the, the kind of lesions, the pleomorphic evolving, invariably joints are not involved, which is more common in the autoimmune or a dysregulated immunity. So these are subtle points which can differentiate between uh, acute viral and the uh, other prolonged disorders. Thank you, Dr. Skara, for those very uh, lucid answers. I think Dr. Sara has joined back. Can you restart, Dr. Sara? Sorry, sorry for it's the okay, loss okay. and connection. Please, yeah. please go ahead. Yeah, so I just wanted to uh, go through some points of uh, introducing orthohantaviruses. These are rodent pro bone, as you know, and uh, each different serotype is hosted by... Make it full screen, Sarah. Each uh, serotype is hosted by a specific rodent species. And of course, there are other uh, orthohantaviruses which are uh, hosted by other small mammals like shrews, moles, and even bats. So basically, there are two different kinds of uh, orthohantaviruses. You have the old world uh, orthohantaviruses, which were earlier discovered. Uh, like in the uh, during the Korean War in 1950. And you have the new world orthohantaviruses, uh, which were discovered as the, you know, uh, as the in 1993. And these two different kinds of hantaviruses, or the old world orthohantaviruses, they cause what is called hemorrhagic fever with renal syndrome. And there are four or five very important viruses which come under the group of uh, HFRS viruses. New world uh, hantaviruses, they uh, generally cause cardiopulmonary syndrome, which is called HCPS. And there are two very uh, important viruses, Synombri and Andes virus, which cause very severe disease. Now, uh, the most important thing to consider here is since they are transmitted by rodents, you could have domestic uh, exposure. You... Uh, uh. Sorry, sir. So uh, uh, what we need to consider is uh, transmission of uh, infection occurs from rodents to humans, either in the domestic settings or it could be in the recreational settings. For example, when there are campers who go out and they get exposed to rodent excreta, please remember aerosols which are generated from uh, contaminated droppings, urine or saliva of rodents can infect humans. There can be uh, occupational exposure also, for example, in farmers, mammal, uh, mammalogists, or uh, rodent handlers. Uh, this is uh, just a slight- screen again. Full screen, Dr. Sarah. Actually, I have some problem with my uh, okay, system. Okay, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Please yeah. So go ahead. Uh, this slide uh, roughly shows you what different kinds of hantavirus we have. I've just highlighted the ones which cause very severe uh, disease in humans, of which the first and the third can uh, are seen in the Asias and uh, Europe, whereas the last two are seen in Americas. Uh, this is the transmission of hantaviruses in uh, transmission of hantaviruses. You can see hantaviruses transmit uh, horizontally between animals and uh, they transmit from animals to humans through uh, viruses which may be present in uh, aerosolized excreta and uh, urine or saliva. Uh, here, uh, this represents the general uh, distribution of orthohantaviruses around the world. You can see the rodent hosts are distributed everywhere. And I, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the distribution of the rodents or the small mammals uh, uh, 
they decide the distribution or they fix this distribution and circulation of ortho hantaviruses. So in uh, Asia, you have a lot of uh, hantan virus, which is uh, transmitted or carried by ratus, 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 novigicus, or mice, apodemus, or even uh, what you call the bandicoots, bandicoota indica. So the distribution of the rodent host actually plays a very important role in the distribution of the different serotypes. Now here I have just very uh, briefly summarized the important clinical features of HFRS, which we saw in the uh, patients when we were doing this study. And uh, very few patients, most of the patients, they, uh, they presented with uh, acute febrile uh, illness. It could be uh, query dengue, query scrub, or query uh, lepto. Uh, very few of them uh, had uh, kidney failure. And it was seen that most of the cases that we saw, they were mild to moderate in severity and complete recovery took place. Uh, uh, when we look at the laboratory diagnosis of ortho hantavirus, there are a wide variety of uh, testing systems that we can use. But uh, since uh, the in the first week after onset, since the signs and symptoms are very, very non-specific, usually the patients uh, present at the clinic, usually after the first week. And uh, at that time, serology becomes uh, the most important tool for testing. Uh, PCR is very useful if you are able to, uh, the patient appears before the first seven days after onset. There are other tools which we have used in our study, ELISA, we have used uh, conventional PCR, real-time PCR. Of course, there are a lot of investigators who are using multiplexed uh, real-time system where you can try to multiplex the different uh, serotypes which may circulate in a particular area. We used Western blot because that was the first time we were the, doing the study on ortho hantaviruses, and we really need to we needed to confirm that our findings were uh, truly uh, correct. We also used uh, serotyping ELISAs. And uh, of course, now microarrays are available where uh, small oligonucleotides are used as fishing nets to look for different pathogens. Uh, NGS can be used for uh, zero, uh, for uh, genotyping, and we have been using NGS extensively during the COVID outbreak. Virus culture can be used for ortho hantaviruses, but again, it requires level three facility, and very few uh, cell lines can be used. For example, Vero E6 cell line, which is uh, not very uh, frequently used in cell culture laboratories. So now I will just go through quickly through uh, my journey and uh, uh, what were our findings. So before I started my study in 1968 already, there was a hantavirus isolate which was uh, reported. It was uh, from an insectivore, a Sankus murinus, which was captured in Velour. It got its name from the place where the insectivore was captured. And there is a very beautiful publication by uh, uh, Carey, uh, Dr. Carey. And uh, this was uh, supposedly the first hantavirus to be ever cultivated. Uh, so when we started our study, we really didn't know what kind of serotype we were looking for, what kind of tools we should use. So since we already had literature that uh, ortho hantaviruses could cause even mild acute febrile illness, the first pilot study we did was on patients, uh, patients with query dengue, query lepto, and query scrub, but neg negative for the respective uh, etiologies. And we found in the pilot study, 12% of our patients were seropositive. We did not restrict ourselves to a single ELISA. It was, uh, we used a heterologous ELISA system, a heterologous system which uh, pooled all the different serotypes that could be present because we did not really did not know what serotype we were looking for. And uh, the pilot study gave us very good results. And we moved on to another larger study where we started looking at patients with acute undifferentiated febrile illness. Uh, 
So we didn't restrict ourselves to dengue-like or lepto-like or scrub-like. We started moving towards patients with acute febrile illness, acute undifferentiated fevers, ranging from two days to 14 days. And we got very good results. I was able to do a, a, a PCR. This was those days of conventional PCR, 2004, 2005. The target was very small. It was only uh, 150 base pairs. Uh, and uh, we found that uh, the, uh, the, uh, what we got uh, positives by, uh, with molecular testing, they showed great homology with Hantan virus. Now, Hantan virus is the one which is commonly seen in Russia, Korea, Thailand, et cetera. So these were studies on patients with acute undifferentiated febrile illness. Next, we wanted to look at seroepidemiological studies. So we had to, uh, um, okay, before I go to that, this is a slide which just gives you a rough uh, idea of what could be the clinical and laboratory findings in patients who are seropositive. What was significant is 75% uh, of those who were seropositive or laboratory confirmed orthohantaviruses, they had thrombocytopenia which you would uh, see in most cases in uh, other parts of the world also. This is a slide which just shows uh, uh, immunofluorescent uh, assay, which we used and uh, Western blot techniques, which we used for confirming our results with ELISA, since this was the first time we were doing uh, hantavirus research in India. So uh, in zero epi epidemiological uh, study, we tried looking at uh, healthy blood donors. We looked at go down workers. We looked at irulas because we know irulas, they catch rats, they consume rats. We looked at patients with uh, chronic renal disease because it is believed that patients who have had hantavirus infections, they go on to developing chronic renal disease. So we found that uh, there was a high degree of seropositivity in irulas, which was very significant from the seropositivity, which was uh, significantly associated with irulas when compared to the seropositivity we saw in healthy blood donors. So then once we got seropositivity and we could study seroprevalence of orthohantavirus, we tried to serotype the virus. We wanted to know which virus is circulating in India. And these samples were uh, actually serotyped with the help of uh, our overseas collaborators. In fact, most of the studies we did uh, with material which was uh, generously donated by collaborators from uh, Germany, uh, from Japan, even from the US Army, uh, you know, uh, US Army, uh, we got uh, control uh, slides. Uh, uh, Sarah, you have only two more minutes. Uh, thank you. Kindly finish it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and uh, the last, uh, nothing would be complete uh, in a, a zoonotic disease without looking at animals. So we did testing on uh, 84 animals, which included rats and bandicoots. And we got similar kinds of results, which we got in uh, human testing. Uh, here too, we used ELISA, uh, Western blot, immunofluorescent assay, RT-PCR, conventional, and uh, real-time. And we found that 19% of the rodents were uh, positive, seropositive. We were able to detect uh, mole by molecular diagnosis. We were able to detect uh, orthohantavirus uh, from the lung and kidney tissue of one uh, bandicoot rat. Dr. Sara, you can wind up. I'm getting messages from the organizers. Time is Yeah, over. sure. So uh, this is my last slide. And uh, this is just to, uh, uh, just to convey the message that there are orthohantaviruses ortho which circulate in India. And uh, it is necessary that we consider hantavirus infections in the differential diagnosis of scrub, uh, lepto, malaria, dengue, and other causes of AUFs. So I would like to wind up by uh, just uh, showing you the, uh, my acknowledgments to all those who have contributed to this uh, preliminary study of orthohantaviruses in India. With this, I wrap up my talk. Thank you so much, sir.